Did you just get finished a workout or something? No, I was running around though. Okay. <laughs> I, was actually, I was actually in the middle of eating something and doing home. And then I'm like, okay, okay, just go and you'll continue after. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Well, thank you for coming on and making the time to speak with me today. Cause uh, I think it's pretty important that uh, people know who you are and that they uh, hear what you have to say, because you, when you speak, I, like it just flows right out of you. Like you can tell that you've been doing it for so long, right? So uh, I'd like to talk about uh, your childhood. What were you like as a kid growing up? Trouble? You know, that's actually something really interesting because um, I, I'm a very big promoter around the environment you grow up in is a result of who you are, basically. Right, right. Um, and me and my sister, for example, were completely different personalities growing up. Oh, Same oh. parents, of course, uh, but completely different personalities. So I was the outgoing person. I could see that, yeah. Of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Super extroverted, always like, it's so funny, Jareen. Like, we've looked back at recordings from maybe when I was like eight, nine, ten, 10, uh, when cameras, I guess, started existing. I'm not too sure. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, you know, when you really think about it, it was yeah, like I know. old camcorders that like had that little thing and you flipped it and you yeah. either had to look at it. Anyway, it was. Yes. But, I, um, I get that. <laughs> so we've looked through and you could see me constantly wanting to be in front of the camera. Like, well, yeah, I'm and either, <laughs> like I'm either singing or doing something or trying to make people laugh or trying, yeah. like I'm such like an, Aqu like I'm definitely an Aquarius. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> very out there and wanting to be like me, me, me. Um, so that was very much me growing up as okay. more of like a child, child, I would say before teenage years. Ah, uh, nice. I, was, I was still that outgoing person, very tomboyish, uh, had a lot of guy friends mainly. Yeah, yeah, I did yeah. have girlfriends, uh, mainly that I was singing with in like talent shows oh, and things that's like right. that. Yes. I love yes. You have a beautiful voice. That's right. I heard it at, uh, I meet the victims. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have it all recorded as well. So yeah. <laughs> when did you hear? Oh yeah. 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 And, um, no, so I love, so I did have like, I was actually the person and still like today that mingled with everyone. Like I had a bunch of like, you know, guy friends. I was super tomboyish, like to wrestle, like to, to do everything that was kind of like being outside, yeah. getting dirty, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I also liked, you know, trying to put makeup on and trying to like <laughs> potentially shave my sister's Barbie's like, hair. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Fantastic. I was, I was definitely rebellious already as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I had the responsibility maybe when I was like 11, 12 ish to babysit my sister. My parents would go out playing darts. Uh, I was raised in like a 2000 population town of, of, of hunters and trappers, actually. Like I, Ooh. I grew up seeing very barbaric things. Um, Ooh, I did yeah, not know like that. Where did you, were you outside of the country? Mang. To, yeah to miss coming like we're borderline Ontario oh, and like we're, okay. there's a few reserves around us like we're very much like immersed in nature um and yeah like barbaric things in the sense of back then even back then not being vegan I thought to myself what is wrong with people like I I did not think I belonged because seeing people kill uh moose and cut their heads off and put their heads in front of their trucks to show off the buck that they just oh killed. Oh my God. Going around town. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. really disgusting kind of. And uh, I even had friends who had parents who trapped. So like I'd go inevitably to her place for something and the garage door would be open and it'd just be all these skins of like oh. you know, coyotes and pumas and like, like, like just, just things that were oh, very, shit. um, yeah, like very disgusting. I actually tried to call the cops on them a few times, <laughs> but they, 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 they didn't care. Unfortunately. No, of course not. Yeah. Um, and it's a small town. Everyone knows everyone. Right. So um, yeah. they, even if they even if it was illegal, which it was for people like them, if you were indigenous, you were allowed to do whatever the heck you wanted. Yeah. But uh, as a you know, French Canadian in Temiskaming, like you had to have a license and there were specific <laughs> times and there was all these things. Right. But anyway, I informed myself because I wanted to know. Of course. Back again. Um, Already starting. Yeah. You what? <laughs> Already starting in the activism. <laughs> Without even knowing. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. I, I, in my mind, I loved animals. Like I loved animals and I never thought for a minute to think of the animals that were on my plate. Actually, that's not entirely true because when I was younger, I questioned it right off the bat. Like yeah. I must have been no, no um, older than five or six. When I understood, like I asked my mom, like, 
kind of you saw one of these videos circulating probably the kid who's talking about the chicken and he's like is that really the like that was when they realized that yeah yeah and and just like is that like really like a chicken chicken like the bird like what do you mean like why why am i yeah this bird like this like what happened right did you actually uh, question that Oh, a hundred percent. And my mom was like, oh, you like, cause I said, well, I don't want to then. Cause she said, well, the bird's dead now. And I was like, well, I don't know <laughs> like, why. Like, I don't want to be responsible for that. I don't want to. And my parents told me that, um, eating protein was necessary, uh-huh. which is true, but they thought that protein meant animals. Right. Yes. And they didn't know any then, better. They didn't know any better. And to be honest, my mom would have had to go to the library to start digging up information and stuff to be like, oh my God, like my five-year-old daughter is questioning me on proteins and stuff right Uh which I wasn't like really questioning her it was more uh uh, refusing to want to eat what was on my plate because I knew it was from a sentient being and I think all kids are vegan right all kids are vegan but hearing that it was Uh a part of the conditioning of being like oh it's me or them it's them or me right and my parents are telling me like this is how it is so just go with it right no one questions it no they don't because it's so indoctrinated into everything right so, so yeah. indoctrinated we're yeah. lucky that we have the internet now though because that's oh. something like social media internet like it has its pros and cons but mm-hmm. in the end like i think that that's what definitely perpetuated the movement that's why it's grown so much across the it, globe right exactly because you can make those widespread connections with everybody and do like a global movement where you couldn't you really share. before yeah you can show right so all of the things that those uh slaughterhouses are trying to hide we're actually able to show the truth and people are starting to make the connection and and that's the difference like back then there wasn't any of that everything was just silence and that's just how it is and it just kept growing and the population kept growing and more animals kept dying I know. like a vicious circle that no one questioned right so kind of thank god for the internet then right really you, when you think about it yeah. i i would say yes a hundred percent for so many reasons but definitely that the sharing of information yeah. and knowledge that's accessible at the fingertip when you have access right exactly exactly yeah. but uh but yeah so very barbaric town as you can see i as a as a child even and like before my teenage years i knew i didn't I always questioned, like I knew I didn't belong, right? Like seeing all of these things. And there were lots of bullies in my school as well, because there was just one school in this 2000 uh, population town. So we're on the board of Ontario. So we had the English side and the French side, and it was from kindergarten all the way up to secondary five, right? Oh, wow. So all the way up until high school and then oh, you're done. Oh, that's what secondary you're... five is? Okay. <laughs> what is that? Sorry, that's Quebec, <laughs> Quebec language right there. Um, until high school. And okay. then you go off to college or, or university or somewhere else, right? Okay. So um, it was very peculiar because the English and the French would always be fighting each other. Then we'd also have like the natives and yeah. like just all were always like, and there's so many bullies and so many to the point where they're like people actually, I have, I know someone who hung himself in my hometown uh, because he was bullied so much. He was actually gay and Aww. he was bullied so much that he just, he just took his life. Right. And oh my God. Yeah, it was really sad. Like, I mean, there was very like horrible things. Like kids are so mean to each other sometimes just yeah. humans are just mean right and depending on how much you've been indoctrinated where you grew up who are your parents like yeah so many factors very there's so many multiple uh, factors that come into play onto how someone's going to behave like that like my god like how uh that had to have been such a stressful environment to grow up in like going to school every day like that in that kind of an environment like how did you deal with that like even when you think about it like when you think i guess it was the years around then or something. But when I think of the people around me, like my parents, everyone's parents, like everyone like drank and smoked and everyone like, like it was just like a very like toxic environment. A hundred percent. Sounds like, like it. Yeah. A hundred percent. And everywhere you looked. Right. And, um, and yeah, being in a school like that, for sure, it was very like uh, divided very divided already. And then seeing that type of bullying, but I was always the person, as I mentioned, that was always getting along with everyone. And that actually was bullying the bullies. Like when I, when people bullied like friends or people that I knew, I would always be defending them. Right. Like not, not definitely not a bully, but just defending, Mm -hmm. defending people from the bullies all the time. And I was, feisty even before I learned how to fight so it's like I already knew like in my mind my dad always told me if someone hits you you hit them back yeah and and I'll be honest I believe that to a degree because 
as much as I don't promote violence, uh-huh. I do think that it's necessary at times because uh-huh. there are some people that, as we've mentioned, are, have been so indoctrinated that they will not change. Like no. nothing will come through to them. And if you're being threatened with a knife or a gun or there's something like you have to respond, right? Uh-huh. Like it's just in your responsibility to respond. So I don't think that it's necessarily a bad thing. I've seen people get hit at school and as their parents said, report it to the person who was there and blah, blah, blah. And uh-huh. then you know what? They get worse after because I now know. they've told on them, now right. they have tales, now blah, blah, blah. Now these people are going to get like worse off, right? So uh-huh. if you don't stop the bullying right off the bat, like it's not, it's not going to end good for you. So, oh and I don't know if that's how I was brought up and that makes sense in my mind, but oh I've God. learned that way. Like I had guys picking on me and like hitting back is what got me respect and yeah. not bully anymore. And that's why bullies would be afraid of. Cause they knew you hit back. <laughs> I'll hit back a hundred percent. That's the thing. I'm not going to let you like drive me to the ground. Right. So that's fabulous. Yeah. Um, so, Okay, so that, that was all the way up to high school then. So, okay, tell me, well, how did this all, how did this take place for you? How did you go into this vegan journey then from oh high school? On? You got to tell me. So actually, uh, it wasn't in high school because in high school is where I started going the opposite direction, where I started being extremely rebellious uh extremely like I ended up um from 16 to 17 in a juvenile center for a year and my parents sent me away because I was like I was out of control but in the sense that as I've told you it's not because I was out of control it's because I didn't feel like I belonged and I was very depressed I was very suicidal I was on drugs I overdosed many times Uh uh I had a very like dark journey during I would say the period of my teenage years juvie then I went out I went to college I did an art program but I ended up getting mononucleosis and I wasn't able to wake up in the morning to go to my classes so like like at all like to the point where my alarm was on and I got people in my building we were eight residents in the building that signed a petition (laughs) because my alarm that was beside my head that was like I was out cold (laughs) cream I wasn't waking up. So it would go off from like 6 a.m. to like 11 a.m. in the building. Oh my God. Beside my head. Like I was out cold. So anyway, that's how I realized how bad it was. And then I started getting um, like, if you miss a certain amount, you can't go back to those classes and stuff. So I ended up quitting and uh, I started working restaurants and bars and things like that. And it's only moving away from Wainaranda and moving into Montreal that my whole journey started like, in my more my mid 20s right like when I was after working in all sorts of bars and stuff like that and living like a wild life (laughs) like you want to talk about having done a a whole 360 degree change like that's my reality that's you right yeah a hundred percent like when I think of the Michelle you know 12 15 20 years ago it's uh it's a lot like it's, it's, it's sad, right? Like it's sad, the things that I've done to myself, uh, but thankfully I grew from that so much. Like, well, think about how much you learned about yourself during that process. Like, come on, like so you took the hard way, right? The very uh, hard way. But you learn faster that way. Uh, like you, yeah. Well, you learn, you learn out of failures. You learn out of discomfort. You learn, you don't learn out of like butterfly and sunshines, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, right. It's you hit the grit, you hit the bottom and you're like, wow, okay, there's only going up from there. Like, how do I and I've really lived a yin yang in my life. Um, And that was a very I had a very like I'd say from maybe 13 to 24. I had a very yang life, like a very like darker Mm. type of, of life. Whereas moving into my 24 when I was diagnosed with MS, At that point, I had found martial arts. So I was in Montreal and I was still waitressing and stuff, but I had found mixed martial arts and I really loved it. So Uh. where I was working was working around my whole schedule with MMA. Okay. And uh, so it just worked perfectly hand in hand. And then one morning I woke up and I lost 50% of strength on my whole right side body. Um, I had no idea. Like I I walked out of bed and I was just like. And this is before you got the diagnosis. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was okay, before sorry. I got the diagnosis. And when I had finally just found like my purpose basically, which in my head was mixed martial arts, right? Like, wow. Aww. Like I was fighting, like I was in this club, like I loved it. Like, um, and I was dedicated, right? Like right. I, I found something that I was passionate about and then that happened, which was physical. <laughs> right? So tell me what happened that morning though. So you wait, like, tell me what happened. Well, I fell out of bed because I wasn't expecting to wake up and have like 50% of strength missing. Yeah. And then it was like, okay, well now I'm not going to work. I'm not going to training. I'm not doing anything. I'm going to emerge. Right. So call in SIG, do all these things, tell a few of my friends. I had one of my fighter friends and my coach who lived in the same building as me. Yeah. So let kind of everyone know when to emerge and uh, they did tons of testing, MRIs and all that. They, they gave me sto- steroids right, right away uh-huh. just to like my, like to shock my body for it to stop attacking itself. They yeah. knew that it was my immune system for sure. That was doing that. Right. To have lost didn't know why. That strength on my whole right side body. Like all of their tests were based on strength and seeing uh-huh. like what kind of peripheral strength I had or like what was going on. Right. Right. And uh, so they knew that there was something there that was nervous, but they didn't know what exactly and what the diagnosis would be. It could be many, many things, right? There's a lot of autoimmune conditions out there that could do things like that. Um, So with the MRIs and stuff, they realized that I only had a whole bunch of inflammation at the cervical level, which was called acute transverse myelitis then because acute, because they didn't know why it just suddenly came on. Transverse myelitis is just what, where it is like at the transverse on the side and, and myelitis because it's in the myelin, which is like the myelin that protects your central nervous system. Right. right. Okay. And there was just so much damage there that they literally told me, you're lucky you're not paralyzed from the neck down. Like they're like literally martial, like training, martial arts, whatever you're doing, like saved your life, honestly. Really? Yeah. But all of my other disgusting habits are what put me there in the first place. Right. Oh, like if martial arts saved me for the connection, yeah, right? Yeah. Like I still had that connection because I have built up so much like strength and mind body connection with that. Because yeah. in martial arts, like you can't, you can't flinch, right? Like you have to always be aware because the moment you flinch, you're getting hit. Right. <laughs> yeah. It makes sense. You learn to, you <laughs> Pay learn attention. To develop awareness very, very wow. much so. But uh, yeah, so it was all from the neck down and it, it, there was nothing in my brain yet. So it was not multiple sclerosis yet because multiple means there has to be multiple uh, lesions and it it was only one lesion at the cervical level. So they had to like cross things off. So they did certain things because they needed to make sure it wasn't like, um, um, I think neuritis optic or something like that. It's like the back of your eye as well, that it could affect you Mm. blind. Like there's all sorts of things with that, right? There's all sorts of labelings and diagnosis that they'll put out there. Um, So basically from that point on, my neurologist told me it's probably better for you to take some um, injections on a daily basis. We wouldn't want you to end up with MS is what he said, because he goes, most people in this situation would end up then being diagnosed with MS. So maybe we could prevent it with the ex- injection. Oh. And what injections, what were, what were in the injections? They were called interferon, which is something that our body produces, but of course oh. it's patented and it's, it's pharmaceuticals. Right. Okay. Um, so I literally, at first I started going through the process because what ended up happening is I said no at that at first. And then I was doing like research and stuff. And my coach back then, thankfully was raised on a reserve in um, Burns city near Vancouver. Okay. And he'd seen people like heal themselves holistically. He'd done like tons of sweat lodges and stuff like that. Like he knew natural alternatives to take care of yourself. Ah. So he had told me like, you know, Michelle, just make sure that you're looking at second opinions, that you're doing your research. Like, don't just start taking meds, like yeah. the pharmaceutical industry, like they <laughs> want, it, it's, hooked. They want their money hooked. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I did research and stuff. And then back then, because I was a fighter, I was also dating a fighter and we were doing like the neurologist told me not to really do hot temperatures and stuff, but I had okay. to keep them in the sauna. Um, and I forgot about what the neurologist had told me. Cause he had said that it could, it could reaffect the damage that was already caused if there's too too much of high temperature, like oh, hot really? baths or saunas and stuff like that. Yeah. So it would so affect this. You what? It would affect your swelling, you mean, like on the cervical collar? Uh, no, it could actually, yeah. Like it would it would get inflamed and it, they would kind of like resurge the, the damage that's already been caused in the sense that you'd feel the sensations. So the numbness could come back or tingling or or similar sensations without necessarily being another episode. Okay. So yeah, it was interesting. So anyway, it happened. 
the next day from doing the sauna with him and stuff, I was feeling all this stuff again on my right side. And I didn't lose 50% of strength, but it was like, it was not fully there. Like I didn't feel good. Like I you felt, tell. I felt, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like it was not the same and stuff. And as a waitress, I used to use everything on my right. Same with, uh, with fighting. Like this is my power hand, right? That right. Oh, and that's and, oh, crap. Uh, my right. But, uh, I relearned how to use everything. Like I changed my stance. I even changed my stance to have my, my right forward. So that, so, but it's good. Cause it was, it all taught me some good stuff. <laughs> awesome. Wow. That's, you just, you can just turn things around like that. That's fantastic. Well, it, oh, don't get me wrong, Jareen. It was very, um, I was lost. Like at first I had no idea. So this brought me down a whole path of self-discovery. Yes. This is what started the vegan journey okay. because I had to research. Like I was trying to understand like what would have caused all of these things, right? Mm -hmm. Like why did this even happen in the first place? Like for once I'm doing something I love, like how is this happening? Right. Yeah. And, uh, and it was just recognizing that it was all of my lifestyle habits that were horrible. Like I had horrible lifestyle habits. I fed myself horribly, like even as an athlete and a mixed martial artist, and even as the athletes there, most of them, like we'd end up at McDonald's all the time, La Belle Province, Burger King, all the crap that was all around there. That was super protein. <laughs> <laughs> well, protein and it's cheap, yeah, right? Like $2 true. and you got a freaking Big Mac and stuff like that. Like, like yeah. I, my body was built on crap. Like my body was built on crap. I used to drink. I used to smoke. I even would smoke cigarettes. I would hide. Like before I was diagnosed with MS, I had been trying to quit for a long time. I did things like Champix, all this kind of stuff that yeah. got me really depressed, all this stuff. Yeah. Anyway, um, I was hiding. I was so embarrassed of smoking and being a mixed martial artist that I would finish training and stuff like that. I'd be home and I'd, I'd go on my back balcony and I could see the gym from where I lived. But if I sat down, no one could see me there. So I would literally sit down and have a cigarette by after doing like Just four hours in the dark. Training, I was so addicted. Like how much did you smoke then? Like not a lot. Smoke, yeah, like no. I smoke like a cigarette every like day, second day. Like I was constantly just, and I would, I would try to not even buy packs. I would buy it off people. I'd like look at someone oh. go oh, a dollar for a cigarette. Like that's yeah, like you didn't want to get caught with that, right? No, and it ended up costing <laughs> me so much more money. <laughs> it was ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> talk about not saving and not being smart yeah but uh, i knew that if i had more it's like having junk food in your home right if you have yeah. a whole of junk food you're gonna eat it yeah it's if hard I had to a whole refrain pack of cigarettes i was gonna smoke it right yeah. like so absolutely so it was really sad back then but anyway yeah. all of my lifestyle habits from smoking drinking the stuff that i ate i didn't go to sleep at proper hours i was watching tv in between everything like it was just always tv tv whatever no. Yeah. I was in a toxic relationship with someone who was super verbally abusive and we ended up cheating on like our partners to, and ended up together that way. Like it was already oh, toxic okay. from the beginning. Like right. there was just, my life was a hot mess. My life was a hot mess. Oh, and if I, yeah. I, Like a hundred percent. Right. And if I really, and it's not until all of that happened, which today I recognize the blessing in disguise. It's not until any of that happened during that. I woke up to my reality. Like I thought that my life was, I thought that I was invincible that I could just like, I mean, I had tried to kill myself. I didn't die. I had overdose. I had all these things. I was eating whatever I wanted, smoking, drinking, going to bed, whatever. Like I was doing whatever I wanted fighting with, you know, guys that are three times my size every day, not getting uh -huh. hurt. Like, like the consequences. I was, yeah. I thought I was invincible. And, yeah. uh, and one day I was proven to not be, <laughs> Wow, what a but it's a good thing though, because I had to research everything and that's how the vegan journey started. Right. That was literally in 2011, 2011 when okay. I was diagnosed with MS. Well, actually it was when I was diagnosed with acute transverse my lattice. And that's when I started like studying everything. It was okay. from March, 2011. And then I started researching, researching that summer. I had another episode with the sauna and stuff. Right. And so then they did another MRI and I had lesions. So they were like, you have MS officially. Um, and then I started the process of getting the injections because like right. my neurologist had called it. I believed him. I was like, oh, well, I, I had done research, but like not enough, uh -huh. but I was still doing like I hadn't stopped. Right. 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 
So I, I said yes for the process. I was going to have a nurse that was going to come to my place. If there were kids that were going to be sent to my place that I was going to be injecting myself, she was going to show oh. me how to do it, all this stuff. And, um, the day that I had everything and that I think two days before the nurse was supposed to come, they finally called me to say, oh, we finally got a new, uh, a nurse from the um, Jewish general hospital in Montreal. And, um, and I said, no, I don't, I don't want to do it. Like I actually, this is going to be my last resort. Like I'm going to do oh, wow. everything before I have to do that. I like, I realized that I have to change the way that I eat. Yeah. I have to change my sleeping patterns. I have to start meditating. I have to start loving myself. Like I have to take care of me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that this stuff, like there's a reason that this is coming up. There's a root cause to all of this. And there were many root causes. Like yeah. my barrel was full. Like I was overflowing yeah. of toxicity out of this barrel. Right. So I had to empty the barrel. I had to start taking toxins out because otherwise it was just going to keep flowing and not in the right way. It was going to progress down the path of MS um, and so, taking the, sorry, what were you going to no, say? No, go ahead. No. So who helped you with this? Like, well, that's the thing, right? No one really in the sense that my coach, then he helped me because he had already planted a seed around dairy, let's say. Okay? okay. And I found a huge correlation with dairy and like dairy actually has a very similar molecular structure to your myelin sheath. So my body, like I was a huge dairy consumer, oh. like disgustingly, like a three bag of milk, every second day cheese what? yogurt every day like i was huge i Shireen, i used to joke about the fact that i probably drank more milk than a baby calf without realizing yeah, that well. that was actually true because they get stolen from their mother and they yeah. don't even get the milk from their I mother know. you know what i mean I like i but i like it was so i was it, so disconnected yeah we so all disconnected. Are. we all were yes yes Wow. Okay. Well, when I found the correlation with yes, dairy okay. and MS, that was already huge. That was like, okay, like, what do you mean? Like my coach back then had been planting the seed already. And he yeah. kept saying, he kept saying, dairy is not good for you. Like, it's not good for you. Like you need, you need to talk to a naturopath, blah, blah, blah. blah. And I kept saying, um, what do you mean? Dairy is going to make my bones super strong. What are you talking about? It's science. It's science. It's been proven. And then, he, <laughs> and then he was like, yeah, but you have to follow the money. My nickname back then was Mickey. You have to follow the money, Mickey. Like you have to follow the money. Like it's not, this is all a um, an industry that's put in place. It doesn't make sense that we drink like cow's milk. Right. And he right. really put that, he wasn't vegan, but he was very like in touch with natural and holistic ways. And he knew that like dairy was not good for you. Right. And it's true. Like I went back to the Institute of Holistic Nutrition a few years ago and studied and like, yeah, I was gonna ask that's the that. first thing they tell you. Really? That's the first thing they tell you, tell your people to get dairy out of their diet. They're not nice. meant to freaking drink. They're not meant to drink cow's milk. Like it's that simple. Right. Wow. Uh, I'm surprised that, well, I mean, I'm surprised that they're, they're teaching that now. Cause I know a few people that were taking like nutrition, holistic course. nutrition, oh, that's not, the difference, not eh? a Canadian uh, food diet, <laughs> yeah. no, not okay. dietitian or whatever. Yeah. Okay. No, no, yeah, no, no. Holistic be... nutritionist. So yeah. now you're, you're being taught the holistic alternatives, right? They right, would right. say like, Oh, if you could have your own cow and drink pasteurized and blah, 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 maybe, but like, the stuff of like, no, we're not, we're not cows. Right? No, it's not cows. Like we don't, I don't wake up and go, moo, go, moo, go, moo. Like it's, <laughs> it's pretty simple. Right. <laughs> so you can imagine Jareen, when I saw the correlation between all that and then Cajun that had been telling me for that long that like dairy wasn't good for me. And then I was seeing, and then I found a swank diet that was specifically for MS, which still today is proven to be 35% more effective than any medication out there. And yet no one fucking tells you about it like, no they, no one tells you about it anyway it, swank yeah swank i was just gonna ask you what that was <laughs> s-w-a-n-k for people okay. who have multiple sclerosis and okay. that actually showed me though in general so anyone with autoimmune disease in the sense that what that doctor had found so dr swank initially had been wheelchair with medication all this stuff and then realized like you know what let me do more research. Cause this, I don't, I'm not accepting, I'm not accepting like what's happening right now and the consequences of my actions and whatnot. Right. right. And finally, uh, after doing research on nutrition and all that, the doctor found the correlation between 
animals and saturated fats and just consuming animals in generation and the uprise in autoimmune and cancers and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it all correlated at the same time that we industrialized animal agriculture, right? Hmm, what a coincidence. So, what a coincidence. So anyway, so smart person, all the guidelines and whatnot for the swank diet was reducing your saturated fats to less than 15 grams a day, which, which is like, like, you know, they were promoting like, um, still chicken, which doesn't make sense because there's oh. actually more fat in chicken now than not, but they were yeah. like, get off the beef, get off the pork. Uh, you could maybe have a little bit of fish. You could maybe have a little bit of chicken. Uh, you can't have lack, you can't have milk and all that kind of stuff. Maybe you could have skim milk. Maybe you could have feta cheese, like trying to minimize it for people and not right. make them freak out. But in the end, it was like, stop eating animals. Yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? Like stop eating saturated fats, stop eating animals. And you're going to solve your problems. Like okay. you're going to actually solve your problems. So um, then I saw all that and then I started doing that, but I ended up because I saw the correlation between the molecular structure and dairy, I, dairy is actually the first thing I took out, which I okay. thought would be the only thing I never take out. Like I would, I yeah. would maybe not eat animals and all that kind of stuff. I never thought I was going to take dairy out. And it's the first thing that went because I realized, you know what, that I'm poisoning myself with this. Wow. Like my body was attacking the dairy to try and get it out of my system. And then, Oh, there's no more dairy. Well, guess what it's attacking next. It's mm -hmm. looking for pathogens and it finds my myelin sheath that looks almost similar because it has similar molecular structure. And there, you know, there you go. Now I'm diagnosed with MS, right? Wow. On top of all the other lifestyle factors, like for my body yeah. to react that way, it was imbalanced, right? I wasn't right. in homeostasis or anything. Okay. Um, so yeah, so it was just honestly just me researching, researching, said no to the meds, started taking, I took dairy out that I took the red meat out. I took, uh, poor, you know, pigs, baby pigs out of my diet. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, fish and chicken were like the last things kind of, but it just, it didn't take very long for me to take no. that out. The only unfortunate thing throughout my journey is up until 2014, because I traveled and I was in Thailand and I was fighting and stuff like that. As much as I had a lot of places with like tofu options and things like that, I didn't have many options with protein. Okay. So it was, Understood. I like the, 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 um, and I wouldn't say negligence, but the, and again, I wasn't fully like educated yet. Like I wasn't okay, like, yeah. I was still very conditioned, like everyone, like, cause my parents still fished and stuff like that. And every time I went back home, Oh, I was always in fights. That's one of the oh. reasons my whole family's vegan now today. I was going to ask but, about that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But they, um, they tried to push it so much, right? Like, Oh, come on. Like, just a little, like every time, like I'd go through the same stuff all the time. And I'm sure all of us go through the same stuff with our friends and family and stuff. Right. Uh. Um, and it was just like horrible, but fish was like the last thing. And to this day, now I'm like, I can't believe I even thought that because they have, and even like it goes as deep as the song from Nirvana where he says, it's okay to eat fish because they don't have any feelings. Oh, and, right. and he Shit. literally says that. And I was such a fan of Nirvana my whole life, oh. like 11, 13, 14. And in my mind, it was that deep. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's okay. They don't have any feelings, but like, that's They're so stupid. not true. Yeah. Yeah, well, I was always like the one second rule with fish. They could only think for a second and then, you know, they're constantly yeah, yeah, yeah. rethinking. They don't the know where they are. That's constantly repeating itself. Yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> kind of, uh, it would kind of be odd if that was true, if you think about it, right? I mean, yeah, uh, very much so. We, we, we believed whatever we were told because it's been passed down so by so many different generations, right? So I, I'm still amazed at how you were able to just yourself make that decision when it's so hard for a lot of us to say, nope, I'm going to investigate that myself. Nope. I'm going to check that out for myself and be oh, your own advocate. Like I, I, it was because of MS though, right? Like yeah. initially for me, it was health that drew me in. It was mm -hmm. coming to all these realizations. And then the more that I realized that the more I started looking at documentaries the more I started. And then I was like traumatized. Like yeah. then that was like a whole other level. Yeah. And, um, but it's only by, I would say from 2011 to 2012 was like my transition. Okay. And 2012 to 2000 and beginning of 15, I was plant-based. Like okay. I was 
plant-based. Like most, I wouldn't say I was vegan, like, right. because I would still once in a while cheat with honey. I would so like little things like that, that like I lived in Australia at that point, I was living at my fr- two of my guy friends house. And like, I was fighting and I, I was like, I was dependent on them really <laughs> bringing okay. me to the groceries and doing things like that. So I actually cooked for the whole house and I was cooking vegan all the time, but there were little things like that sometimes that I would do, or that I wouldn't even realize wasn't something, or I wasn't careful then. Right. Okay. Whereas now I'm like a strict vegan, like yes. since 2015, like I've been a really strict vegan. Like I look at everything. I don't make exceptions. I don't like, I don't, I don't even eat in, actually that's not since 2015. I would say since 2000 and. 17 i don't eat in non-vegan restaurants i don't like i'm very very anal when it comes to like not wanting because i've had moments where i was eating in a non-vegan restaurant and they told me what i was eating was vegan and they're like oh oh yeah i think there's beef bouillon in that yeah right like like, are you fucking kidding me so anyway so when you feel like your body's been a temple for so long and then you turn around and you tell me you put carcasses in my things like no so um i liberation pledge then sorry did you take that then yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're, you're f- totally for that. So I was going to ask your opinion on that. Okay, good. I even have my fork. <laughs> Do you really? Oh, Do you know how it happened, Doreen? I no. actually, I want to show you my fork. Please, Can go I get, get your fork. Yes, yes go I get your it. fork. <laughs> so literally, this is my story, okay? Oh. So I was about maybe 12 or 13 years old. And I was, we were at camp and there was a garage sale and this was a part of that garage sale. And it was a fork, right. With the bent whole yeah. like little things. And it's super pretty. Um, and I thought to myself, I thought it was really cool back then, but I literally never wore this until now. Well, until the past few years, yeah, yeah. like I had that in a little souvenir box <laughs> that like, I had oh. kept for the, like this entire time. And then when I signed the liberation pledge, I thought to myself, I have a full bracelet somewhere. (laughs) Like I actually have a freaking bracelet already. Really creepy and awesome at the same time. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like what a, Wow. Like you, you odds, bought a liberation right? fork before you took the pledge. Like, <laughs> Even like it existed. 10 plus years before. <laughs> right. And I wonder if the wow. person that put that there had taken the liberation pledge or if it even existed already. Right? I, don't know. I have to Google that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so you're a hardcore vegan now. Um, how did you transition from hardcore vegan to activist or was like how did that go like you went vegan how long afterwards did you go into activism um okay so activism though I was always active from day one in the sense that I'm someone who loves to learn and I love to share what I'm learning so everything that I would learn I was like flabbergasted. Like I was a, like, I couldn't believe the atrocities. I couldn't believe I'd been lied to my whole life. I couldn't believe all these things. So I was screaming it at the top of my lungs. I was every conversation I had, every sp- person I spoke to, did you see this documentary? Like, can you even believe blah, blah. like, I just couldn't believe it. And I'd put it all over social media. Like I was very uh-huh. active when it came to that, when it came to friends and family and stuff, but I never, I didn't even knew that events existed. Like I didn't even knew that activism existed when I was in Montreal. I had no idea. And then I ended up traveling to like Thailand then back to Australia. And then I ended up coming to Ontario, which is what brought me here is I was in a relationship with an Australian back then. And I helped his brother had married a Canadian here in Burlington, Ontario. So he knew he wanted to come back to Canada. I would have come back to Canada and Montreal, but Mm -hmm. he wanted to come close to his brother and he only spoke English and I speak three languages. So for me, it was like speaking English, speaking French or speaking Spanish. I mean, I could go wherever. Right. So I I didn't mind continuing my adventure from Australia and on. Um, So I was like, you know what, let's just go to Ontario then. So we installed ourselves in um, Burlington. And at that point, like he was already living vegan with me and all that. I had gone to uh, Vipassana in Australia, which is a 10 day silent meditation. Oh and God. I had like, they're all vegetarian there, but I had lived vegan there. And I, uh, even though they had like big bowls of cheese and shit, ugh. anyway, um, <laughs> I was, I know it's so good. Yeah. I got the last Vipassana's I did. Cause I've done four of the 10 day silent meditations. 
the last ones I've done was waiting until the end to talk to the people from the kitchen to like, see like, how the hell can we get dairy out of this? Cause this yeah. makes sense. like you're preaching about may all beings be happy. Right. And that are the dairy sense. cows happy. Exactly. No, they're yeah. freaking enslaved. So anyway, so I, um, and I spoke about that a lot, but regardless, I had done that in Australia and my first 10 day like that was very reflective. And like, I grew so much out of that. And when I came back to Ontario, I was like, okay, like I want to get involved. Like I want to get involved. So it didn't take time. It didn't take oh, much right. time from the moment I got back to Ontario. It might, might've taken about like six months for me oh, to awesome. install myself here and like I had a whole bunch of stuff that I had to deal with like I had to go bankrupt I had like I had a whole bunch of stuff I had to deal with um and uh and then finally I found a group near me which was the save movement and it was the chicken save in Brampton oh. and the reason I ended up there oh actually so no so there you go I came back to Canada hardcore vegan but it took me a year before I actually started doing activism or I actually found groups because I oh, had okay. started joining groups but I had never found I didn't know the safe movement existed mm -hmm. I didn't know anonymous for the voiceless DXC I had just like I was following James Aspey and um Eddie Carbstrong and all these people a uh, Joey Carbstrong and yep. all these people that I was like really obsessed with their activism and, yeah. Earthling Ed and stuff. Actually earthling Ed came out later. He okay. came out later, but I was watching these guys and I was like obsessed with their grassroots, like street activism and the talks that they were doing. And I was like, I want to be that person. Like yeah. I want to do that. Right. I want to talk to the world like enough. Like, I don't want to just talk to my friend that's not doing anything. Like I want to talk to like a thousand people at the right. same time. Right. Wow. And, uh, and then I came across groups like AD save all that. And then I realized like, Oh my God, there was a save movement that was super close in Brampton because I was going to school at uh, the Institute of Holistic Nutrition in Mississauga. <laughs> While I had already like I skipped the whole place there, but I was already like coaching and training. And now I had started my own business. I left good life. Da, da, da. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> and, um, <laughs> so at this point, yeah, I just um, oh, my God, I lost my train of thought. There. That's I'm OK. Thinking, I started thinking of everything that like happened that I skipped over. And I was like, do I even mention this or do I just like oh forget, like, pretend it didn't happen? Uh, that's OK. I mean, I, and if I laugh too hard, I forget it like just shoots right out of my head. So I forgot what you were talking about, too. It happens when you get old. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> we're both like where was I I'm like I, I said so many things oh, I know that's awesome um okay so uh going hardcore into activism basically how mm -hmm. you went so fast and you couldn't find the groups and then you found the save movement oh, yeah. in there exactly. yeah that's what we were and that's why I was talking about IHM because that's where yes. I was studying at the time and I had become self-employed. So in between my training hours and going to uh, the Institute of Holistic Nutrition, I found a gap that worked with the one in Brampton for the chicken save. So I drove there in between my like five hours of school in the morning. I went to Brampton before I came back to Oakville for my clients here in the evening <laughs> oh, for them after they finished work. But so it was like from three to five, I think that they ran it or no, actually two to four. I think they ran it. And I met um, Mariah, Aaron and Daniel. There were three people there. And I was like, oh, my God, like it, it was small. Of course, I didn't ever seen anything big. And yeah. in my mind, I was like, like minded people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yay! I was right? like, the first vegans I had ever met. Do you understand? Oh. Like, like. Like in the sense that actually that's not true at IHN, I had met a few vegans and stuff. So that was recent to Ontario, okay. but like in traveling, I met vegans and things like that. But like, it was like the first time that I thought to myself, I'm going to have like weekly friends that I can yeah, I know, right? that, like, I are, friends. That think like me, right. That yeah. are fighting for like a bigger purpose kind of thing than just themselves. Um, and it was so like, I saw actually, interestingly enough, during that time, then I started following earthling ed as well. And then I saw that save specifically there in Brampton for the chicken save. They had never been able to stop a truck before. And then one, one day earthling ed came with Mariah and, and Aaron, David, uh, Daniel, and then a whole <sighs> bunch of other people showed up. So we were about 40 there. So we were finally able to stop a truck.
for me, what was really emotional was what the way Mariah responded. Cause like she had been there for four years already and had never been able to stop a truck. She'd yeah. been there with her sign for four fucking years. Do you know what Aww. I mean? Like standing on the side of the street at Maple Lodge, this horrible industry that takes the lives of half a million chickens every day, every day, half a million chickens, Jesus. half a million every day, 500,000. I can't even like, wrap my head around that. You can't like, I can't even wrap my head around like, that. Like, like, how can you, how the fuck is that even possible? Like, and they claim to be halal. Oh, bull. Oh, are, well, you, <laughs> like, can't, you can't, how are you going to kill 500,000 chickens a day and no make sense. sure that they're all, you know, yeah, what? sliced nicely and all, of uh, um, what's uh, yeah, it's haram. That's all I gotta say. Killed it's humanely. Haram. Yeah, just the so, word humanely, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh no, no. So anyway, so she was so emotional and she was like, it's been, and she cried. And like, I remember I still have that video that pops up in memories sometimes. And, uh, it was a very special day, but that's where I learned about Thierman's in, uh, Burlington. That's why I learned about, uh, the Toronto cow save. That's why I learned. And so I started now because I was, I was my, uh, own employee, and I was able to go to school in between. So I was trying to juggle and put, those times and and it just became like almost like a religion for me where I was like I need to be there like it's in my duty to be there for the fucking animals and unfortunately at first it was mainly all bearing witness so I growing up thought I loved animals so much that I wouldn't even be able to become a, a veterinarian because I was so afraid of having to euthanize or having to see animals that come in hurt and all that stuff I didn't think my heart could handle it right Mm -hmm. So you could imagine that bearing witness is uh, very fucking traumatizing. Yeah. And the first time that I did the chicken where we actually were able to stop the trucks, right. it was the first time that the truck didn't just fly by. Right. So I was able to connect with the chickens mm-hmm. and they sounded like my cats. Like they oh, purr. No right? They're like, oh, they kind I of didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. So it was really, really like I just bawled my fucking eyes out. Like it was like so, and they were all gashed and they're all messed up and they were just slammed in these trucks. And I couldn't even imagine. It's only later, someone that you've already interviewed, David, uh, the 40 year old vegan, that he explained to me how it was really, how they were actually handled on the inside and stuff. And it just like, and the horror stories and stuff. And it's like, fuck, man. Like, so you can see, you know what actually happened. Like, to that chicken before it even got on the truck right exactly so. and then what happens to that chicken after mm-hmm. he, as he's getting off the truck right? and how they unload those crates so gently yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. like just all of that and how they handle them right mm-hmm. like they're freaking objects like, yeah, it's like they're nothing like, like yeah. they're nothing mm-hmm. like it's like they're worth a dollar. Like, it's yeah. just like, it's a life. It's a freaking life. Right. So anyway, then I did the fear men's. I, I was bearing witness to the pigs as well, which was another like really brutal, uh, thing. And, um, like, again, like just, you know, seeing them with their snouts coming out and just like, it's just, they're so dog. Like they're so like beings that I've seen my whole life. Right. That people yeah. love and interact with. And yet they turn around and, they eat beings just like them without even questioning it for one second. Like, yeah, absolutely. Speciesism uh, is ingrained in people. Yeah. And speciesism is just this. Freaking, but so yeah, anyway. So. When uh, with the with Fearmans, uh, I was actually watching one of your videos today. Uh, I did not know that uh, you had interviewed Reagan Russell. And I just watched that interview today. I was like, oh, my God. Like, yeah. how... How was that for you? Like, who was she to you? So, well, Regan was there pretty much every week, right? So I had known her for a bit. Like, she wasn't my best friend. I didn't, like, talk, have extremely long conversations with her all the time. But Mm -hmm. enough that it was always, like, an accolade. Like, hey, nice to see you. Good to see you here. Da-da-da. And just, like, good conversations, right? She was such a kind soul. She always smiled. She vibrated so much. And you know, I knew that she was a lot older than me. Um, and I knew that she had been doing this for a long time. So that day, like specifically, I wanted, I was there with, um, uh, Jonathan back then, who's another activist. And, um, I had asked him if he could, like, we had mics and we had my GoPro and we had all that. And I wanted him to record as I interviewed different, I, I said like leaders or people who have good stories. Right. 
And uh, I had uh, interviewed like Lori, I had interviewed Rob. And then I saw Regan and I said, oh, she's going to have some good stories. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Like she's like old school. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And she was like, so we just had an amazing talk. The, the lack of regard for the feelings of our fellow earthlings it is shocking. Yes, it is. So wow. we're, I come every Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and oh my god, honestly, like since 1970, <laughs> taking action well, to create change in this world. If that's not powerful, like holy I'm trying. Crap, I need I need a high high for that. Well, like, I don't I don't I don't know if it does any good, but I know it does. I know doing nothing, nothing does no good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Doing nothing does yeah. nothing. Talk, right? And I knew uh, that what had happened, I had just um been with her the week before for the sled dog. Um, she had invited us to go to Hamilton for a premiere for the sled dog um, premiere that uh, Fern did and all that. Like there was a, she was involved with that. She had right. put up a whole theater together with Mark Powell, her now husband um, or her, her husband. And right. um, they uh, had like, she had a whole table at the back with all the flyers around veganism. Aww. And like, she was like, su- like just super well set up. And we, ended up leaving after I was with two more activists and we had a huge conversation with the mashers that had showed up there. Mushers. Right, mushers, mushers, yeah, mushers. mushers yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. If I, I'm thinking, I'm thinking death metal, uh, mosh pits and stuff. Yeah, I know. <laughs> mushers. Yeah. And we were in a huge conversation with them, like kind of like arguments and stuff. One of them, I even have, I actually fell on one of her cards not too long ago. She was like, come see my dogs, blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, Anyway, we, we, we had a huge debate. It lasted two, three hours. But um, then I had seen that Regan that Sunday and I had just asked her like, hey, like, tell us some good stories. Right. Yeah, and yeah. she had great stories. Like she'd been doing this since uh, 19, uh, I think 60. Uh, sorry, 79? 73. Yeah, 73 is what I got. 73. 73 eh? yeah. I remember yeah, that yeah. the year I was born. <laughs> That's how I remembered it. I watched that today. So yeah. 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 So she like she was old school and like she said like back in the day like she was there like when they were banging baby seals over the head and she was like I thought to myself I'll show up with a sign and everyone's just gonna like understand and side with me and it's the opposite right we're so hated to try and stop the extreme abuse on animals it's so fucked up it's so fucked up like it's so like (laughs) <laughs> mind-blowing fucked up mind-blowing but uh yeah no Regan was definitely uh yeah it was fuck when that happened like that was crazy that day were you like, there that day no I was home and I was working and I had just my phone was blowing up and I don't usually I don't have notifications but I went on Facebook and there was all these like R- uh RIP 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 like oh fearmans fearmans and I'm like what the fuck like I was like what happened what happened and um and then I realized it was her I was driving there already when I found out that it was her I think I heard it on the radio or something and I was like oh my god it's Regan and like everything just like like rose on me and I was like holy shit and I saw her body there because they hadn't removed it yet by the time oh, I got no. there they're not very far right so she was under the truck like all the way where he had like dragged her body for uh-huh. 50 feet and everyone was there like the people that had seen her like it was just traumatic there was so many people that showed up though like there was already like almost a hundred plus people there and um Maybe not a hundred. Maybe that's in my head. Like in my head, it looked like there was so many people right. everywhere, and police lights, and all this shit happening. But like, a lot of commotion. I don't know, right? But uh, it was it was really sad. It was really sad, and and I, that's the first thought that I thought in the back of my mind was I had such a backup of GoPro videos, and I had not edited that video yet. I hadn't even put it online. Oh, wow. I had Lori's. I had Rob's. I had hers. I had put no one from that day. And I thought to myself, I need to go fucking put this out there right now for the world to see her. Do you know what I mean? I'm so glad that you did. She said so many beautiful things that day. And like, it, she really spoke through her soul, right? Like she was, um, she was a very beautiful soul. And uh, like the fact that that happened to her is really, really sad. And still to this day, like we go, well, I try to go to as many of the events as possible, uh, either that are her memorials or that, you know, we went to the police station not too long ago. Um, and then they were like, Oh, it's not happening. Like they were trying to bully us out of the parking and we all stood our ground and stayed with Mark. Right. 
and and uh josh her her stepson and everything and um and it was just uh yeah it's it's just crazy the way that like like say for example to give you an example a woman was hit in the niagara region okay okay um she died as well and the person was uh had jail for four years and it was a very similar situation the person wasn't drunk or anything, wasn't anything. They were just crotch that woman was hitting like a pe- um, well, pedestrian walkway or something and okay. didn't like hit the woman, whatever. She died on the spot or something. And uh, sh- that person got four years. And Regan Russell's, uh, the trucker who hit her, uh, who literally stopped at the red light. Actually, sorry, it was a green light. That's why it was so misleading. Right. He stopped at the green light in the middle, like he wasn't going. And as it was going about to turn red, he fucking stepped on it, right? And he and he he drove over her. Like he didn't yeah. even give her any time. Like it no. was like so, like that was intent. Do you understand? Like that is criminal intent. And this guy was charged with traffic lights. Traffic light infringement. Are you fucking kidding me? Like because once it went red, he then stepped on it, right? Because he wasn't going the whole time. It was it was green. Traffic light infringement. Are you fucking kidding me? Like so really- the murder part meant nothing no no all that and they never released the camera they never released the the videos that was there they never released like it's just like it was such a fucking scam against activists and that was right bill 156 passed three days before that and she was there that day speaking up against bill 156 and she was so pissed mark said it so many times he was like the night before she was going off and she was going there specifically to fight against bill 156 could not believe that we were going to start being charged criminally to be giving water to pigs right that are heading to fucking slaughter the only little bit of love that they're ever going to get uh-huh. and it's just like honestly okay uh-huh. there you go It was not okay. Like just everything that happened around that and around Regan and her death and her trial and just all of that has been so shady and so many things have been kept hidden and the the truckers raised over like $200,000 for that trucker to try and court fees and shit. Yeah. In less than like three days. Oh my God. Yeah. And that's anyway. pathetic. I'm sorry. Yes. I know. Um, Absolutely pathetic. Like you're fucking raising funds for a guy who just murdered a woman who's been protecting this planet for like 35 years. Yeah. Yeah. So you need to tell me then how, how do you and, or whether is there anything offered to you and the other activists to, um, to help you like, to like is there anything i know you guys have each other as activists right you have a lot of friends but do you go to counseling for that do you do anything from from what you've witnessed or what like especially with regan like that's traumatic i think i've witnessed a lot of traumatic things exactly i know so what how about we talk about this how do you maintain your balance then um Honestly, meditation is key. Uh, I teach now, like I have an online membership. So that also keeps me accountable because Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 12 to one, I move with my crew, right? We move for 45 minutes and then we meditate and stretch for 15. And on the weekends, I teach NBC on Sunday nights. We do uh, like 15 minute talk on compassion and nonviolent communication. And then we do a 45 minute stretch. I dance a few times a week. I do boxing. So I take lots of that energy out. Uh, I really believe in movement and freeing like the soul and the mind and I love to just like read more, educate. Like, I feel like the more I'm able to answer people's questions, the the more at ease I feel, right? Like, I don't, I feel like I'm ready. Like I'm prepared, right? Like I can, I can have conversations. I can have dialogue. I've been working a lot of my, on my own communication to be able and on again, nonviolent communication has helped me so much. So like anyone watching this nvc.org, like so worth it. And go put a play in. Okay, go download the needs chart, go download the feelings chart and start understanding what it's like to like self empathize and feel for yourself and understand what it's like to even be able to identify with vocabulary and feel like you're you're heard by yourself, right? Uh-huh. And sometimes by others as well. That's a huge part. Um, 
and even just meditating for myself. I do lots of like, uh, tarot reading and stuff like that i have like that keep me and 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 give me motivation i love to also do yoga i have a really good support system when it comes with people around me okay. like i'm lucky i'm really lucky i definitely take care of my mental health i don't get me wrong i'm human i cry a lot because yeah. like there's just so much i can do <laughs> and it's, it's, I wish it's, it's, way more right because it's it's got it's overwhelming right like very there's overwhelming. so much of it is some days you're okay but then you know yeah. you go to the grocery store oh, <laughs> right yeah. and, you, and all you see uh, is death around you right it's everywhere, everywhere. but there's dead bodies dead bodies everywhere and but you're doing um so much right uh that sometimes i think it's very effective for people to have counseling um I, I do it too. Like uh, I haven't seen half of what you've seen, what you have seen um, or David for crying out loud. He's seen so much too. Um, and well, we each other a lot, right? Yeah. Like, like That's what I, I was gonna ask. have read a lot on psychology and things like that. And, and okay. even again, like the nonviolent communication aspect, like all of these things. So I do use that a lot with my people and like, you know, people like David, Ina, like we talk to each other a lot and we, we vent because we have to, right. But I still do think that I believe in therapy and counseling a hundred percent. I think for some people it, it might not be that affordable, but there are yeah. means and there are ways around here, but that's something that I've actually been <laughs> thinking about for a long time to the extent that I actually branded an app called talk through and it's meant to specifically help connect people who have similar experiences that are within their vicinity so that they can exchange at a very like affordable fee. So you have like listeners and, and um, talkers and basically the talkers are the ones that need to talk whatever's going on. And the listeners are the one that have similar experience or that have something that the talkers attracted to so that they can talk things through and uh, at a very affordable and convenient place. Right. So. Wow. That's a brilliant idea. Because I looked into therapy, Doreen, and I was like, I cannot justify paying $250 an hour for this when I already know the information. I already know what they're going to tell me. I'm not saying that I'm not going to learn from what they're going to tell me. Not at all. I think I'm a student for life. Uh But I do think that I know a lot of that information and that if I just apply the knowledge that I already have, I don't need to be paying someone else $250 an hour. True that, true that. Um, so it does tie into um, your your business, right? The yeah. I love balance. Exactly, so, exactly. Uh, so give me, a, a, I know you kind of did a description here, but give me the official description of your company. Like if someone was to say, what is I love balance about? What would you say? So, well, I love balance is just to make it clear is I as in third eye chakra, right? Not I as in like me, my mind. Okay. <laughs> it's more I because it's the vision, right? right. It's, being a- it's being able to see. It's our perspective. It's all about the perspective that we have. Mm-hmm. So I love as in our heart chakra, right? That green and all my colors are respective. So if you look at the eye, it's that indigo color. If you look at the heart chakra, it's green. So my eye is indigo. My love is green. I even have that in my hair. Like I have my brand colors and everything. And the balance is purple because balance could be your root chakra but purple is also your crown chakra purple is also my favorite color and when it comes to balance you need the balance between your root and your crown chakra and at the end of the day it's like understanding the reason why i founded i love balance is because it's more than just one thing like everyone's looking for like this one magic pill they're looking for this one thing for to resolve their health issues or to be optimally healthy mm-hmm. but at the end of the day it you need balance with everything like you need to look at all and every factor of your life and we all have the answers from within so it's really just about digging and finding mm-hmm. out like what it is that works for us and what that brings what brings our body into balance right, right. And that's what I love balance is about. And for me, like even ironically with being diagnosed with an autoimmune disease with like one of the first things to go when you have MS is your balance. Right? Oh. That's one of the first uh, oh, yeah. 
of multiple sclerosis is your off balance. So to me, there's lots of significance to why I chose I love balance in that sense. Uh And, uh, and that's it. I offer different programs. I offer uh, meal plans and recipes. I offer meditation programs, progressive meditations, and I have lives that I spoke about earlier as well. And I'm constantly working on new things and wanting to make courses available. And actually very soon, Right now, the membership that I have Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays and Sundays is more dedicated for activists and and friends and and clients that I've had and whatnot. But I think that on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I've been toying with the idea of making a class specifically for people with autoimmune disease or that have physical ailments and issues that would Uh be more like a a chair or like a grounded style uh, movement to to specifically move the spine more to get things going so that people feel better because I do believe that you can heal with movement 100%. I think that's a really good idea because uh, a lot of people like myself, probably, you could think of that. Uh, I have uh, a lot of uh, disabilities um, and a lot of movement issues. Mm -hmm. So uh, finding someone to teach me how to exercise in a way where I won't hurt myself, yeah. right, is key. Um, and I can't do it myself, right? And a lot of people are like me. I mean, yeah. I can look at the, I can look at the YouTube and try to do the yoga the way they're, they're doing it, but I would need that one-on-one uh, with someone. Yeah. And that's what you're offering for people, correct? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. yes, but to a certain extent, because I already have like my one-on-one privates, my oh, Tuesday, wow. Thursday would be more of a group setting where I could still, it is still sort of one-on-one because we're there and we're live. So I know yes. who's there and I know what's happening in that moment, but it's not directly one-on-one because the thing is, is with one-on-ones, you only have so many hours in a day. Right. True. And Take a long time. to reduce the one-on-ones because, you know, right now I've had my same clients that have been following, following me since forever. Like most of my clients I've been seeing for five, four, three years, mm-hmm. actually wow. all of my clients, except recently I've acquired one new client in time that I allocated specifically because she wants to box and stretch. And I love that. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome box and stretch i love teaching boxing i love it so much and i do. love helping someone stretch yeah eh? so mm-hmm. tell me about all your all, all your qualifications because uh, i have them written down but tell like you've got a lot so all of your schooling tell me what you've got um okay so i don't have very conventional schooling no. eh? so oh. i went to high school then i did that program in arts which i ended up quitting because i had mononucleosis and i couldn't go to classes and stuff. Most of my life experience, uh, most of my schooling comes from life experience in the sense that once I moved to Montreal uh, and I started working like as a waitress and stuff like that, I was training at TriStar. I started teaching under my coach. So that same coach that I was talking about earlier, Mm -hmm. he was teaching me mixed martial arts. So often he had his own clients. And after a few years that he started teaching me how to teach his clients or his clients, kids, So I was already starting to coach there at the gym and it was mainly teaching uh, jujitsu and a little bit of grappling and boxing. So a variety of things. And then when I moved away and I ended up in uh, Thailand to go fight and compete in uh, Muay Thai specifically, because I had been putting that in my head with Thai teachers at TriStar that were like, you're not going to live the dream if you don't go to Thailand to fight. And I was like, all right, I went to Thailand for three months out there and, um, learn how to fight out there. Then I went to Australia. I did a last fight there. And when I, sorry, oh my God, I lost my train of thought. I started thinking about my fighting again. What was your exact question (laughs) that I was answering before I go off on a whole other thing? Oh shit. (laughs) I know you caught me off guard. (laughs) Oh no, you're like me. (laughs) Okay, Uh, we're going to remember. We just have to take a moment. Yeah, you know, because we were talking about uh, stuff. Um, There's a reason. Why the heck was I talking about that? I came on the fighting for something super specific. Yeah, because you went to Thailand and stuff. And it just blew my mind. No, but there was a reason why I talked about that specifically and it just like escaped my mind. um, It was... We're talking about your qualifications. Oh yeah, that's it. Oh my God. And I was talking about life experience and stuff. So basically okay. Thailand, I was fighting out there and, and whatnot, then Australia. But when I came back to uh, Burlington, 
I applied right away to a good life fitness and the teacher, well, actually the fitness manager there and just overall manager actually of the entire region in Ontario, he was a K one fighter. So his background was mixed martial arts as well. So he was like, Oh, so we talked that. So he literally asked me, he said, okay, for the next three weeks, you have to come every morning at 7am. And so like without working, right. Without getting paid or anything. So I showed up every morning at 7am. And I, in the meantime, I was applying at other places. I was doing all these other things showing up at 7am every morning. And he was teaching me for an hour or two hours, the different movements. Cause the thing is, is I knew mixed martial arts Mm -hmm. really well, but when it came to resistance training, I knew nothing. Like I knew conditioning, I knew squats, push-ups, lunges, all that stuff. But when it came to like lifting weights, doing presses, doing all of that Mm. stuff, like I knew nothing. I knew nothing about the anatomy in that way. I like, I, like, I really didn't know much there. So um, he helped me during those weeks. And then once you become, and then he hired me as a personal trainer for good life. And I was already a level two from the beginning. And then they, um, you're required to then do your CanFit Pro to then, and then with your CanFit Pro, for example, you have to get every year you have to renew and you have to get a certain amount of continuous education points. Uh, then from that point, I decided, you know what? I actually want to be self-employed. Like I coached for long enough because I already had previous experience. And then I gained tons of clients there just from, honestly, just from doing crazy stuff, like yeah. climbing the TRX and turning around and doing sit-ups on the bars and like, like doing stupid things is what yeah. drew clients in to ask to want to work with me right okay and so then I decided to go self-employed and I decided okay I want to go back to the institute of holistic nutrition I want to become a holistic nutritionist so that not only for myself like I had already figured everything out for myself I wanted to make sure that I could adapt that for other people too because everyone has very unique bodies and unique situations right so that actually did disappoint me a little bit because Mm -hmm. they One thing that was good is yes, take dairy out. That was like every class, but there's a huge thing on like grass fed animals and like all this stuff. Like, like it was, Oh, there was classes that were so hard, but I found amazing vegan friends then. Oh, good. And then it was just that it was like with uh, camp it pro, I went back to do like um, my pre and postnatal fitness. Then I did like, I did just a whole bunch of different certifications and things like that to keep updated. And like every year you have to do your CPR, AD, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's just everything like hands down, you learn as you go. And then Mm -hmm. I did a fascial stretching as well. I did, um, what else is the, um, and just like movement assessment, like just everything to try and understand and then studied myself. Right. Cause I am very much of a learner and you'll Aquarius is, or are like that very (laughs) Um, So just learning as much as possible and then and then experience like trying it with clients like even to this day for example I am not a certified massage therapist but I do have a practitioner room and a massage table and I do massage some of my clients like I help them with whatever ailments that they have or fascial release stretching things like that like it's to me that just you know how to do it. You taught yourself, right? That's it. And yeah. I, and I've done it on athletes. I've done like it's self-taught, right? So that's amazing. I would say uh, lots of school of hard knocks. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah. And then of course having to upkeep and getting the different certifications in order for me to have insurance, in order for right. me to not you know be liable, and mm. like all of these things to cover my butt and be smart because you know sometimes you you need to join the system to beat the system. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, you do a lot of your, uh, classes virtually also, uh, obviously, right? Yes. Yeah. And I have people that come here still, okay. uh, the few select at this point in time that are not bothered with everything happening in the world. Okay. Um, and the rest are online. Okay. That's freaking amazing. Uh, so how do you fit, uh, activism in there? Cause I see you always being active. So <laughs> like, where does that come in? I wonder myself sometimes, Jereen, like, how am I even making this happen? Right. But, uh, and that's where balance comes in too, right? Mm-hmm. It's, uh, first of all, I feel like I've created an amazing support system with the activists around me and they're very much like minds. And I would give any, like, I would die for these people. Do you know what I mean? Like, Absolutely. and I would die for a lot of animals, not a lot of humans. <laughs> I'm kidding. But <laughs> so these people need to be special. Yeah, <laughs> they exactly. <feel> they're special. <laughs> 
but, um, but no, so yeah, I've created an amazing system around me with, uh, with people that support me and it makes me want to keep going. Right. Like I have all these friends that organize different events, whether it's, whether it's we, the free, whether it's, uh, AV and honest for the voiceless and cubes, whether it's the save movement, whether it's, um, DXC, whether it's for free Toronto, whether it's my own organizations, whether we're doing banner drops, whether we're going, like, I just always, you want to be on the go. People. I, I love the people around me and I want to, I want to help the animals as much as I can. So if I could do that with a bunch of awesome people, then that's the way to go, you know? And you're unstoppable, right? I just make it happen yeah, sometimes just, just and scheduling. It. Yeah. yeah. Scheduling <laughs> is, I write everything down, like everything. Lists, lists, lists everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. Mm, good. Uh, you kind of have to be organized. Uh, and that's one of, uh, speaking of that, um, how about we talk about uh, AAM? Ooh, that's actually uh, funny enough. At eight o'clock, I have a call with them. <laughs> right? See, so that's awesome. It's our monthly uh, monthly meeting on. The oh, is it? Of, uh, <laughs> yes, the second Wednesday of every month. <laughs> okay. Well, why don't you tell us uh, a little bit about what role you play? So um, animal activism mentorship is an amazing organization. I didn't even knew they existed until Trey Morrow approached me. Um, I guess last year potentially. Okay. And uh, he was just saying like, Hey, we, we have this organization going, like we're providing mentors for people, people across the globe. We try and match people as accurate as possible. Right. And, uh, and he was like, would you like to be a mentor? Like you're super active in the community. Someone else recommended you. Would you like to be a uh, mentor? And I said, yeah, I'd love that. So, uh, so I basically, they just ask you to fill out all your profile, just show the different styles of activism that you've done, which yeah. I've pretty much done everything <laughs> everything um like everything yeah. you could imagine it's happened except undercover footage in a slaughterhouse i have not done that i have entered fur farms mm -hmm. but when they were actually thankfully shut down i we didn't know that they were shut down oh. so that was a blessing that was like oh my god oh. thank god but all the empty cages and shit like oh yeah and I have done one liberation but i've uh, for our chickens oh. but i've never like uh, been into like a slaughterhouse to like try and get undercover footage and stuff like i have not and i would not be able to do that like i don't no. want to do that i'm gonna yeah. be traumatized yeah. and suffer with ptsd for the rest of my life right yeah so, exactly yeah so some people can do it some people can't right there's yeah, jobs for exactly. everybody there's enough jobs to go around in the activism exactly. world yeah yeah so basically just filling out the profile, doing all that stuff. And then once you've um, entered in all the information, they know where you're from, you have monthly meetings and they pair you up with mentees. So actually from your end, I don't know what the, uh, what the process application was with mentees, which I always found was very interesting because Jereen is a mentee of mine, but she like leads like every organization in Edmonton possible. I'm like, how, how are you a mentee? I feel like we have very accurate experience. <laughs> and then I recommended you as a mentor already, by the way. <laughs> so hopefully they reached out to you and were like, hey, <laughs> I was like, I think we miss this is disorganization, but I think it's all in her head. No, kidding. <laughs> yeah, right. Probably is. But no, I think I thought uh, uh, for, for me on my end to, to, to get a mentor, um, I had interviewed someone uh, and she had told me that she got a mentor through the program. And uh, I, being as new as I am, I thought, well, I should probably have some guidance because I don't know what the fuck I'm doing half the time. Right? You just... <laughs> That's all of like, us, I think. Right? I think so. it. Like, I, I, I totally have the fake it till you make it philosophy going on. Like, if they think I know what I'm doing, right? <laughs> and that's okay. Um, yeah. I can pull it off. Um, but for me, I all I did was just answer a few questions and... Uh, uh, what it was that I thought I needed. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, they actually brought up a list of people of who could be a mentor. And I saw your name like, ah! <laughs> That's so yeah. cool. Okay. Yeah. I had no idea. I didn't know yeah. that they gave like a choice. I thought they just kind of like selected Spit it out. Yeah. 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 I thought it was by uh, luck. That we well, I think it is for some, I know, right? Uh, for, for some people, it probably is luck, but yeah, like, yeah, if they yeah. don't know anybody, but I, I knew your name. I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's definitely That's the so one. Cool. That makes me so happy. <laughs> and when I saw your name too, I was like, wait, what? And then I, I'm like, am I thinking about the same person? And then I went on Facebook and I'm like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what is she doing? I'm like, but that's good. Cause I also love just, I love brainstorming and I love mm -hmm. exchanging information and learning from another and all that kind of stuff. So that's sort of Absolutely. what you were looking for too, right? A bit more Absolutely. But not, but you, you have your shit together. It's just a question of like, yeah. Um, 
putting everything into action. Until you figure it out because yeah. it's, it's all a figuring out process. Like we just keep doing what we can and as best as we can until something freaking happens. Exactly. Of course, it's better if we become more and more strategic as we go along. Yes, <laughs> this is true. This is true. Um, and so how long have you been a mentor then? Uh, just about a year now with them. Okay. Okay. That's fantastic. Yeah. Though. I would say that I've helped mentor tons of people in, in the past few years. Oh yeah. But not through the AAM program, just through people following my journey and seeing what I'm doing and meeting people at events and yeah. always trying to be the person that, uh, that wants to motivate others to come back. Right. right. Like I don't want activists to drop off like flies like I want activists to come have a good experience and be like oh my god I want to come back like I want to keep encouraging these people like we need people to drive us to come back like we want to feel like we belong and that's one of the biggest lessons I learned growing up was Mm -hmm. the reason I you know ended up in doing drugs and like all the like so depressed was because I never felt like I belonged and so if you meet that need for someone especially when you're already a part of society like when you you already have have such a you such a burden on yourself because you everywhere you look is like just unfairness and injustice right for like so many beings like including humans yeah and it's just uh and, and but the thing is is our fellow humans are just so ignorant to the reality that happens for a- animals that can't speak for themselves mm-hmm. well they could sure as hell scream and cry and do everything else but they can't speak our language so they can't look at you and be like can you please stop, stop. hurting me Right. Right. Uh, yeah. The sounds of their scream aren't indicative enough that they're suffering. Right. Apparently. But, hey, yeah. <laughs> but then that's the indoctrination, the desensitization. And that's where, thank God, I've learned NBC because because the blame that I have towards others is huge. Like I've had to like put positive affirmations like I am non-judgmental, I am accepting, I am because it's it's hard to not blame everyone as you look at them making stupid choices that are just destroying our planet I know. and they make fun of it some people make fun of it right and it's just mm-hmm. like how like how like it's so so it's thank god for yeah. NBC and understanding that like these people are trying to meet their needs it, they're not trying to attack me personally they're mm. not trying to do this to hurt me they're not even trying to hurt the animals they've just been taught a certain way and they're trying to meet their needs in the only way that they know how exactly. and that's it right exactly very well said yes um i'm intrigued to know what uh one of your most memorable outreach conversations have been for you you know it's funny that you say that because it was recently so I feel that outreach conversations just get better and better over time um actually there's many many conversations I've had where people are like they're going vegan by the end of that conversation 100% right like it's and they've said it like you know what like and they're they've already been closed though usually it's vegetarians that I'm like oh so I guess you know what two main conversations pop up in my mind right now okay the first one was after uh the animal rights march this summer and we were, I, I, I took a taxi cause we were all going to go eat together. And like, we were a big group of people trying to go eat somewhere. And I called an Uber and I asked for a van specifically so I could try and fit as many people that couldn't necessarily pay to get there. or didn't have cars. Okay. And the guy, I went to sit at the front and because of COVID times and all this, he said, Oh, I, I don't, I usually take people at the front, but he said, I respect your cause. So I'll let you sit in. So I sat in and I said, oh, I said, so do we have a fellow vegan here? And he said, well, I'm vegetarian. And then I said, well, that just means you're a vegan waiting to happen. Right? That's awesome. I love that. <laughs> and then we got so everyone's in the back and I can't believe no one recorded this, but the, just from where we were there to the, the restaurant, which was not even like 13 minutes. I got this guy to fully commit, like everyone high fived them. We all get like, he literally went from like, I just explained every, cause I said, why did you, why did, why were you vegetarian in the first place? Like, oh, you know, I saw videos, blah, blah. And I said, really? I said, that's why I always find that's really interesting when people tell me it's from an ethical standpoint, because the dairy industry is actually the worst one of them all, right? Not only is the dairy cow exploited and abused for anywhere between five to seven years, where every year she's artificially inseminated and has her babies taken from her, right? over and over again so she could produce milk for us and then she's killed while her babies are also either put right back into the industry to be exploited 
or called veal and poor little babies are heading to slaughter to get killed. So tell me if that sounds ethical to you and And why we would still be consuming that. And I said, and on top of that, on top of that, I don't hear you mooing at me right now. We're not fucking cows. It's pretty simple. Like it doesn't even go beyond that. I go as a holistic nutritionist. It's so inflammatory for you. Get off the tit. Get off the tit. He was like, okay, you know what? You're right. Today, tomorrow, like never again. And we were all like, yeah, on in the taxi. And it was really good. And then other activists that were new activists, well, some were newer activists had that I had actually recruited had seen me do that. And it inspires them, right? They're like, fuck, I can have conversations like that. Um, And actually not too long ago, interestingly enough, I actually posted that conversation. I, there was this, I was with the um, uh, Extinction Rebellion uh, blocking the highway for yes. in solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en. And this man was at the front park there. And he was, there was one of our people with a QR code to give him information. And he did, and he was like all pissed off. And I just asked like, uh, you scan the QR code, right? And she's like, no, blah, blah, blah. And then he's like, Bleh. and then I started laughing because he was putting his window up and I started laughing because that's a natural almost reaction of mine now to, I have to take things lightly. Yeah. Otherwise I'll kill people. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, but, I know. I know what you, you mean. know what yes. I mean? Yes. <laughs> like a little bit, like I, I almost yeah. have to like force myself to take it in a funny way. Yes. And so I laughed and then he goes, he starts taking his, his window back down. He goes, why are you laughing? <laughs> and I go, I just find it super funny. It's super funny that it's because of people like you that all of the shit that's happening in this world keeps perpetuating. Now, I think you said good people like you. Good, you actually, yes, yeah, I did, did. say yeah. because of good people like you, uh-huh. because that takes their defense down, right? Like I'm yeah. already sending them a compliment. Like uh-huh. I know you're a good person, man. You just don't have the information, right? Yeah. And he started so pissed at first where he's like, no, whatever. And then he was like, well, I agree with you, but you don't have to keep me here. I agree with you. And I was like, yeah, but it's because the people that agree and do nothing. That's why nothing changes. Uh So I said, any social movement, we actually have to stand up. We have to decide to stop and make other people stop. Otherwise we never stop. We just keep going our own on, on our own little mundane lives and never stop. Right. So the conversation finished where he laughed like he was laughing because he, he agreed with me. And then he was like happy. And then he actually took the QR code. Right. Oh, fantastic. So like, that was just like, no, that guy probably didn't go home and was vegan all of a sudden or anything like that. But I could guarantee you that the seed that was planted in his mind and the conversation he had and the fact that he already agreed with me, this was an activist waiting to happen. Yeah. Like yeah. he's going to, he's going to come back this person. I'm going to see this person one day. I, I think you. so. Years, I'm, probably. Okay. That's cool. We'll, we'll time it. Uh, but I, I think you might be right. Um, I think uh, I like the way it has to feel good uh, to be able to transition Right, someone's mind like a great like it was only a few minutes from anger to happy, and mm-hmm. so with your nonviolent uh, confrontational training, that's yeah. where you learned that skill to yeah. to a hundred percent. Because in my mind, it's like, what is this person's need? Like they have urgency, they have to be somewhere, they have. But that's what I kept telling them: like everyone has to be somewhere. We all have to be somewhere. Like if we don't stop nothing ever changes. Like I was really emphasizing on the change, right? Mm -hmm. Like understand. And so it's like, the thing is, is I stayed really calm the whole time too. And, and I was very like smiling, like, like you need to understand, like, and I kept saying, we're not here to piss you off. We want you to be pissed off at what's happening in the world. Yeah. you know and he got it like he because yeah. like how can you be upset at me like I'm just explaining to you why we're here in a very polite way and trying to explain to you that I don't want you to be upset yeah. that's not my goal my goal is not for you to be upset right you want and the, he got it he exactly. got what the goal was yeah and then uh, um like did you have any more confrontations like that with angry people as because you would you guys were holding the light for just a certain amount of time and then you'd yeah. let everybody clear and then you just do it again oh yeah there no uh throughout my activism yes i've had tons of people oh my god not too long ago (laughs) we were doing a w uh uh, sorry a um 
yeah, we, the free WTF. And, uh, this guy, we were in a place where I think there was lots of drug addicts or something. And he just kept like charging at us and then moved and then charged and then moved. And then I was holding a TV at one point and this lady came with her whole, uh, cart and she like, I thought she was going to like aggress me. Like I thought I, I thought I tried to protect the TV because I thought she was going to yeah. bang her part in the TV. Yeah. And she was like, you guys are out. like, she just screamed at me. And, like, oh, <laughs> and then the thing is, is like, I'm a weapon at the same time. So it's like, I don't want okay, like to <laughs> use it. Like what, like, am I going to have to do something right now? Like that's what happens often in the back of my mind when confrontation yeah. happens. It's like, I know what to do to manipulate you and hold you and submit you right mm -hmm. now but do I want it to escalate mm -hmm. to that point like right. I have to like ooh, really be like <laughs> exactly no that's a that's a really good skill to have and I think that uh, activists should be taking that everywhere um and I like, guess I think they should like in any organization we should like be sending them off to a training session like save movement, whatever, just so that we all know how to do this uh, effectively. 100%. It's funny you say that because the save movement right now, I'm in talks with Adrian because okay. we want to sign them to get on so that everyone has access to my membership, right? So like Ooh. a corporate membership basically with save so that nice. they could access it, which would be amazing because that Absolutely. gives, and, and I'm, I'm very like, I don't want to toot my horn, but I'm very uplifting. Like I like to talk to people about, how empowered they are like just remember it's not just about exercise it's just not just about it's that mind body connection yeah. and it's knowing that it all starts here mm -hmm. so if you're able to be in control and master your own mind everything else is easy after that that takes a lot of work <laughs> and that dedication a lot of work. But you have to start somewhere yeah, right do. if you never do anything then it only get gets worse it doesn't get better absolutely and can i ask then how is your ms today awesome like, like yeah I, I don't, I have no symptoms mind, I, don't, I don't have ms like yeah. i was i was labeled with a set of symptoms back then mm -hmm. because of what i was doing to myself but i got to the root cause yeah. and yeah. i've been dealing with it ever since and i have like every possible superfood in my body like i take care of myself again i meditate i do i meditate i medicate <laughs> well, <laughs> nice. only with marijuana yeah 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 for <laughs> sure natural stuff right there um, you go and, you know, marijuana is actually the first thing at the top of the list when you have MS, right? Because Absolutely. it's known to calm your nervous system mm -hmm. and your nervous system, your immune system is attacking your nervous system. So you kind of want to like calm that shit down. down a bit. Yeah. Um, and as you know, I'm a very high energetical person. So uh -huh. I'm always like, go, 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 go. So actually smoking a little bit of marijuana in the evenings, like helps. Oh, me. wind you down. Yeah. Oh yeah. Find, find my balance. Like, mm -hmm. and you know what? I know that I could meditate instead. I know that I could do all these other things, but I literally enjoy this right now. Yeah. Well, then do it. Exactly. Right. And it's working. <laughs> That's exactly how I see it. Right. And it's working. <laughs> and it's working. Right. And to be real with you, Jareen, the two mm -hmm. times that I went off marijuana was when I was traveling and uh, for like longer periods of time, because I've yeah. done tolerance breaks, like months and things like that, just oh, to yeah. give my lungs a break and stuff like that. Absolutely. But um, I've had relapses, like I've had weird episodes and symptoms spark up when I'm not smoking. Oh. And that could be like, to me, that's probably stress related, right? Because I'm used to coping with my stress with marijuana in the mm -hmm. sense that like, that's what relaxes me, right? Right. That's what helps me not get so upset at the mm -hmm. world all the time. <laughs> oh, I think we all need something like that, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And meditation would work too, though. I'm it just would not, too. It would too. Um, I'm not fully dedicated to just that. I, I combine them together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And I think you got to find what works for you because everyone is different, and yeah. it's not going to work for everybody. Um, no, 100. percent And it's right? not something that I do during the day either. And when no. I'm teaching and doing all my stuff and being productive and having to do whatever, but I couldn't. Yeah, that does help me yeah. tone it down a little bit. And it, like you said, it is holistic, and I take it myself as well. So, yeah. um, and I think it's it's a great. Uh, Especially it's, for chronic pain, a hundred percent. Right, absolutely. Yeah, you know, it's funny how some people don't understand that, but uh, I um, know the, tab the taboo though that also comes it down. It really does to how our governments and the authorities 
portrayed a certain thing right and so now it's legal but people ha- still have it in their mind like that like what if what it was the devil like it was right. the drug like the drug and it's like it's like this is just an organization that decided to put that in your head like yep. because that was an industry that couldn't be patented and that was actually being profitable mm-hmm. like hemp and and ropes and clothes and all this stuff and oh, oh. people could do that on their own Fuck no, make yeah. that illegal. Yeah. People dependent on our system. Absolutely. I totally agree with you 100% on that shit. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to talk quickly about uh, your most recent activism victories. What has gone on recently that you were involved with that has. All of the fur campaigns, like that is so exciting. Like mm-hmm. all of the like Saks Fifth Avenue, uh, Canada Goose, Moose Knuckles, Rud Sag, Dolce & Gabbana, Montclair, like all of the like just Bay Hutt, one, like one, one all of the them, they're just one after the other finally yeah. are all going fur free. Um, again, I don't promote those companies because they're still using animals in all sorts of other ways, yeah. uh, you know, as trying to make profit as much as they can from innocent beings so i wouldn't promote them but i'm sure as hell happy that the fur bearing animals are not getting killed anymore for their blood money right like that's amazing those are great wins yeah they're uh, right. and you got to take them when you when they come along you got to like, right? yeah. yeah we have to take those wins mm-hmm. those companies would have not gone fur free if we wouldn't have been literally disrupting them emailing them, campaigning them, calling them, being there day in, day out. Like they would have not gone for free. They were harassed by activists in different locations nonstop and realized if we don't do it and get with the times, uh, like literally they're not going to stop in our profit every day. They're having, or once at least a week, they're having to close down shop because we're out front and we're screaming at them. Right. Exactly. Not screaming. We're informing them and we're asking them, why the fuck are you still abusing animals for money? This yeah. is messed up. Right. Yep. Um, so yeah, so those come that that's been an amazing win uh, yeah, lately. And just recently, actually yesterday, Nathaniel Screen Smith um, just introduced a um, members bill specifically to ban fur farming in Canada. What? So- at a federal level. So I know that we ban fur farms. We yeah. just got off an interview with like fur bearers and with um no ban fur farms, BC. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And yeah, so basically he introduced that, which is amazing because now the more we emphasize on that, the more we get. But I think, which kind of sucks because that's the question I ask fur bearers is like, but why are they only banning mink? Like the transmission, the risk for health, all these things are for any animals that are fur bearing and that are trapped for fashion. So like there's chinchilla out there, there's still fox, there's still, why only mink? Like I get it's the bulk, but why not all fur bearing animals? And that's what they did try to do. But then when it passed, they passed it for mink. And now it's like, these people are going to try and now find any other fucking animal they can take from. Do you Mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like it's just like, Oh, so you just have to keep fighting against you have to keep fighting so the fight isn't over by it's fighting. not over no. but at least it's getting closer yes. and closer and with covid and all this stuff happening like it's huge right ireland mm. banned fur because after having to call or kill four hundred thousand minks because of transmission between mink and human and denmark had millions of mink that were killed so much so they called them zombie minks that were uh rising up because of all the gases that were being released oh from where they them and buried them they were rising up from the dead right the fucking zombie mink and, and so they're kind of on a ban over there like lots of countries around the world are starting to ban and oh now that happened in bc because of the risk for transmission and they had um disease specialists doctors and stuff talking and and saying that that's like basically um how can you say that um affirming that it's also the truth like that this could potentially happen Mm -hmm. and if we look at what they're saying here in Ontario like they're going to do everything in their power to stop the transmission and blah 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 yeah well that's not true so if it's true then ban fur farms all of it like now all Mm -hmm. of the fucking fur farms that's it start with that do you know what I mean like absolutely is is that uh something that you guys are going to be working on now like yeah yeah we're with uh, we branded a company uh, an organization called Effin, so it's E F F O N, so it's End Fur Farming Ontario. Okay, perfect. 
Yeah. Perfect. So, and we're going to, we're going to make it happen for sure. It's happening this year for sure. I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. I usually, this is my last question. I ask everybody, um, yeah. what would you say to an activist or sorry, not to an activist, a vegan out there on the couch watching this interview interview right now, who is not active, what would you say to them? Okay. So, Oh man, I would say something that really, really, really um, grabbed my attention a while back is something I heard from earthling Ed actually in one of his workshops in Toronto specifically. So he said, imagine three scenarios. Okay. And the first scenario is someone walking down an alley, just minding their own business. And at the end of this alley, there's a guy with a stick beating a dog, right? And you're walking down the alley da, 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 and then you at, at the end of the alley and you see this guy beating the dog. And then you see all these people around, no one's doing anything. And, and the guy looks at you and goes, do you, can you help me? And you think to yourself, oh, well, I guess I'll help him. Like no one's cares. Like no one says this is morally wrong. No right. one's trying to stop the guy. So I might as well help him. So he helps him beat the dog and the dog dies. Right. Scenario number two. And that's a meat eater. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Number two, right. <laughs> yeah. The vegan is walking down, da, 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 sees the person uh, beating the dog. And right. Even though no one's doing anything, no one knows that it's morally wrong and says, what are you doing? Why are you beating this dog? The person's like, please help me. And he's like, no, I'm not going to partake in this and walks away. Uh-huh. That's a vegan, right? You're seeing the violence. You're seeing what's happening. And yet in this story, the dog still dies, right? The person still kills the dog because you decided not to contribute, but you walked away and that violence continued. And the vegan activist walks down that alleyway, sees the man, man's ask, want to help me? Of course not. The person takes the dog and leaves with the dog. Potentially, if the person was me, I would potentially beat that person (laughs) beforehand with that same (laughs) stick they tried to hurt the dog with. And then I would take the dog and leave. Um, And that's an activist. Because at the end of the day, just because you stopped being a part of the problem, you're not helping stop the problem. And we have to help stop the problem. It's in our duty. We have the information. We have to not only share that information, we have to do everything in our power to make this stop because there is injustices happening worldwide. You already know there's a reason you're vegan. Don't be a silent vegan. Please don't be a silent vegan. Like, honestly, I, I, I thank you so much for being vegan. That's amazing. Like that makes me extremely happy that you have gone down that path and you've made those decisions and you've, you've educated and informed yourself enough to make those moral decisions. But at the end of it though, it just continues happening and humans continue to breed into existence and it's going to get worse. So we actually need you. We need you on board and we need you to get active because we need this to stop. And we needed all of this to stop yesterday. Right. And it's only the people that are already informed right now that we need them on our side. There's so many vegans out there. We need you to get active with us. We need you to get active. And the thing is, is you could think of getting active as, Oh my God, I don't want to disrupt a store. I don't want to talk in a megaphone. I, I don't like humans. Like I get it. Yeah. That's okay. Maybe yeah. you don't. There's so many ways. Like I put, I have stickers all over my car. I wear shirts all the time that spark conversations, whether it's, whether it's pants, shirts, I've got pins on my coats that are fur free, ban horse drawn carriages, extinction rebellion, a lot, what, whatever, everything. You can have cards in your pockets that you can hand out to people. Yeah. You can literally post online every day. You could help us do the campaigns, call the companies. You could call your MP, your MPP. You could talk about like, there's so much that you can do. Activism yeah. is so much. It doesn't mean that you have to be out bearing witness and what and looking at the suffering in the eyes you don't have to do that there's so many different ways so look at the ways that works for you there's so many organizations out there and if you don't know where to start like please reach out to me or reach reach out to jareen and we will help you 
find what works best for you because in every social movement, there's many different branches and we need to address all of those branches. We need to address the art. We need to address the media. We need to address the politics, the law. We need mm-hmm. to address the mental health and balance. We need to address the grassroots. We need to address all of those branches together to get ultimately to our goal. Right. So, so we need you. So please, please like, don't wait, don't wait. There's a reason you're vegan. And I know that you're dying inside. There's a flame dying inside for you to actually do something. When I started taking action, it changed my life. I was like, I felt liberated. I'm here to liberate animals. And yet I felt liberated. That's powerful. Isn't it? (laughs) It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um... It, it's, it's liberating. To I couldn't have up. said it any better. Like that, um, very well said. That's what I have to say to that. That was awesome. Um, Thank and you. I felt yeah. like I channeled that sometimes. You did. Happened. I couldn't. I didn't want to interrupt, man. <laughs> it just flowed right out of you. It was awesome. Um, and I, I hope that uh, if a vegan is listening and they're not active, that they choose to do so based on that, because that was that was nicely said. I hope so too. And yeah. just don't hesitate to reach out. We'll help point you in the right direction, a hundred percent. Absolutely. But we need you. <laughs> Well, Michelle, this has been awesome. We've been talking for an hour and 45 minutes. I know. Uh, oh, my God. Fabulous. <laughs> it's going to be fun editing this one. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Trust me. I know I have a GoPro in my head all the time. And I know I you do. Full events, so. I know yeah, I, you I, do. I, I, you I, just I edit there. minimally. Mm-hmm. That no, exactly. But, you know, I think I, I was talking to someone today about that style. Um, one of my friends who I was telling that I was interviewing you. And I think I said, we need that style. People need to see like the whole event, how it holds, like, because that's that too will excite people and get them involved mm-hmm. in the whole thing too. So, yeah, to but, see, uh, like the, the hard work in the back end as well, right? It's not exactly. just all beautiful highlights and reels. Yeah, yeah. There's actually like we have to work, like we're volunteering here. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, uh, okay, so I'm going to end it here. Amazing. Uh, thank yes. you so much. No, for- no thank you. Um, you are, like I said, you're a force to be reckoned with. Uh, we need more powerful women activists out there and you're definitely one of them um and i thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your thoughts and your wisdom with me and uh, allowing me to share it with everybody else yes a hundred percent thank you so much you're so you're so welcome Um, (laughs) you're like me you're so fucking welcome (laughs) all right you have a good night and uh uh, have a great phone call it's with aam right yeah 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 yeah. (laughs) perfect timing absolutely yes i will talk to you soon have a great night all right peace out (laughs) bye